If your RV has a generator like ours, whether it came pre-installed from the factory or you added it later, or even if you have an external generator that you plug into your shore power connection, this is an engine, it needs maintenance. And in fact, it might need more maintenance than you think. The maintenance schedule for a generator is based on hours versus miles. Obviously these things don't have wheels on them, so there are no miles. Your generator may have a meter directly on it somewhere. For hours in particular, since this is connected to our one control system by Lippert that came with our RV, the hours are tracked in there. Hours is currently at 236 hours, but that's not accurate because about a year and a half, two years ago, we swapped out our generator module for one that had a generator start built into it. We're gonna cover a little bit of that in a bit. But when we swap that, it reset us to zero. So I kind of have to keep track manually. It's not a bad idea to do it anyway. So right off the bat, first things first, every generator is different. Even every Cummins generator is different and has a different manual. You want to read your manual for these. It has a lot of good information in there, a lot of good safety tips, but in particular, it'll have your maintenance schedule for your exact device so you know what to do. Now, one thing you'll probably notice on most of these generators is they have a break-in period and a very, very short window before you need your first oil change. For hours, it's only 20 hours. If you don't get that initial oil change done properly, at least close to that 20 hours or whatever your manual says, it could be real problems. Our generator requires an oil and filter change every 150 hours. I've been doing it a little bit more frequently than that just because I like to change it at least once a year. Uh, we don't use our generator a whole lot, just at rest area sometimes, and even less now that we have a solar system and basically don't need the generator to run an AC and the microwave and all that at a rest stop. About every 500 hours is when it's required to change the fuel filter and the spark plug. I'm not gonna do those now because we're not near that 500 hours yet, but I am gonna talk about them and show you where they are on here. Another quick note before I get started on this, besides your break-in period, you wanna make sure you exercise your generator. Mm, just doing my workout. Tuesday's arms and back. Oh, I could barely lift my right arm because I did so many. You wanna run this thing about once a month for at least a half an hour to an hour under load. So it's actually working hard and getting that exercise it needs. The generator, like a lot of things, needs to be run if you just let the thing sit for a year and then you go to crank it up when you're boondocking for the first time, you're probably gonna be really disappointed. All right, so let's jump in here. For hours, this just pops off and comes off here. Uh, this kind of brings me to a tip actually. Some people might think that when your generator's running and it's really, really hot, you might wanna pull this panel off so it kind of can have air in here and cool. That's not the thing to do. You wanna have this cover on at all times while this is running, strictly because the way the airflow is designed in here, it's designed to have this on. Otherwise, you're not gonna have optimum airflow inside here and you're not gonna have optimum cooling. I know it's counterintuitive. You might think, oh, let's pull the cover off, get more air in there. That's not the case. You wanna have this cover on at all times while this is running. So some of the things you just wanna kinda of look at in here, just give it a good physical inspection. You wanna check your battery cables. You know, if you've got this connected to a dedicated lead acid battery, you know those lead acid batteries can get all corroded. You wanna keep those clean so it has a good starting connection. You also want to check your fuel lines. For ours, our fuel lines come in right to the side here and go right to a fuel filter underneath. Just kind of give the thing a good general inspection. Of course, you also want to check your oil periodically, particularly if you're going to be boondocking and you know you're going to get a lot of use out of your generator soon. Check your oil, make sure it's good. Yeah, that oil needs to be changed. So. You can see it's a short little dipstick. It's not the kind that's in your car or truck where it goes way down in there, but it does work the same in that you want to pull it out, clean it off, put it back in, take it back out, and then read your levels. You also want to check your exhaust system, make sure that it's free and clear of any debris. There aren't any mud daubers up into your tailpipe. And you, of course, also want to make sure it's free of any grass or things that it can set on fire because it's going to get hot. But just give it kind of a once over and check everything over. 
But now we're gonna get into the 150 hour maintenance, which is the oil change, filter change, and the air filter change. Step one is to run the generator. You wanna warm it up a little bit so it kind of warms up that oil, loosens it up, stirs it up. For that, I'm gonna put the cover back on. But before I do that, I'm gonna throw my breakers here for my 30 amp. Basically, that supplies the 110 volts AC to the rig through the transfer switch. Uh, I'm turning those off because I wanna run the generator, but I don't want it supplying power to our RV. Our automatic transfer switch has generator priority, which means that uh, when I kick this on and it warms up and supplies power, that transfer switch is gonna switch me off of shore power and over to generator power. I don't wanna do that right now. I'll do it later when I wanna do it under load. Right now, I just wanna run the engine, get the oil going, but I don't want it to kick over to this versus shore power because we're on 50 amp, it's 100 degrees, all three ACs are running inside. I don't want to disrupt that. You know what? I've never actually started this from outside here. Let's give that a shot. I usually start it from the one control inside, but I'm going to try starting it here. Prime it. For a second. And then I'm going to start it. I'm going to put my cover back on let it warm up. Okay, I ran the Jenny for about 10 minutes. It's good and warmed up. I can hear it tinking and tanging and doing its you know, metal expansion thing. The point of running it now is just to warm the engine itself up, warm the oil up, get it a little bit loose so it drains out. Obviously, since we just did that, the engine's hot. So be careful, use some common sense here. The next step is you want to disconnect your negative battery terminal from the generator. This is just a precaution so that if you do have like an AGS, which is automatic generator start, or someone inside decides to start the generator, I don't know. But as a precaution, we disconnect a negative terminal so that way this thing can't start while we're changing the oil. Because negative and DC system Systems is also usually a system ground. You want to make sure this thing isn't just laying on the frame on the bottom here or something because that's going to be no different than having it connected typically. So disconnect it, make sure it's not going to rest on any kind of ground. So we're good to go here. Let's talk a little bit about some tools and parts you're going to need. Again, refer to your user's manual for the actual parts. Onans are usually pretty good. You can find a lot of the Onan parts on Amazon. I actually bought a kit that has the oil filter, air filter, fuel filter, everything in it, including a wrench that's sized appropriately for the oil filter. So these tend to sometimes get stripped out and just damage the filter instead of pulling it out. So I also have an automatic adjusting filter puller that can actually dig in and get stuff. So we'll see if I need this or not. Hopefully not, it's just there as a backup. Along with the tools, you'll need a socket, something that's designed to fit. Also take into account how much room you have. In our particular spot now, I don't have a lot of room here, so I did use the jacks and bring the entire RV up just a little bit because I just didn't have enough room under here. So be courteous if you're on a, an actual cement pad, you don't want to get oil on it. The rocks I'm not too worried about. You're also going to need something to drain your oil in. I like to have one of these guys around because it's easy to probably get, heck, I could probably get another five or six oil changes out of this. You want to dispose of your dirty oil responsibly. Collect it in this for a while after you get a few and you want to uh, dump it out. Go to an auto parts store like a O'Reilly or Napa or whatever. Most of those can take your recycled oil for a fee. So our next step in this process is to remove the fill cap so it has an outlet for air when I pull the drain on this. Our model is actually really easy. It's got your fill cap here so you pull that and then this is the actual drain plug that goes down to a rubber outlet down here. The catch is ours hits the frame just a little bit so sometimes oil hits that and leaks off so we're going to see if we can avoid that. I could just get something in here to hold that out. That'll work. A little rock. 
but really now it's just a matter of putting my drain receptacle underneath here and opening this. So let's do that while the engine's still warm. Slide that under here. Don't need that. Backing this off here. Should see it start to drain. Looks like my little rock is working. It's not draining all over the frame. The first time I did this, you know, half of it hits the frame, then it runs off to the sides and makes for a bit of a messy situation. It's not draining very fast, but that's okay. Just let it drain until it's done. The oil has been draining on this for about 20 minutes or so. It's not a very fast draining system. You just want to let it go until nothing else comes out. Ours was down to a drip, so now I can shut off this. The engine was just warmed up, so it can be pretty hot. Use some gloves if it's too hot in here. Again, some of these other parts of the engine are gonna be hotter than this, like the head here is still a little hot. Now comes the part that is usually the most difficult part when you're talking about oil changes, and that's getting the filter out and replacing it. Will this thing work, or will it just strip out the top of my filter? Let's find out. There we go. That's seated on there pretty good. See if I've got enough room for this. Oh yeah, that's the way to go. And again, be careful because when this drops, it's gonna have lots of hot oil. Well, that's not too bad. Not too bad at all. I think that's one of the cleanest filter pulls I've ever done. Huh? Plus one for the tool that came with the kit. I'll have a link to that kit below, by the way. So you want to take your new filter and you want to get some oil and you can use your new oil, but this is just for the seal. So I'm just going to get some right off of here. And you want to lube this up so it gets a good seal. You also want to make sure that the filter you pull off, that the O-ring comes with it. If your O-ring didn't come off with your oil filter, get a flathead screwdriver or something up in there and get that O-ring off. New filter, O-ring lubed up there. Now it's just a matter of popping it in, hand tightening it. And then after you hand tighten it, you give it about a quarter turn extra with the wrench and that should be plenty. You don't want to crank the thing down because the next time you go to change it, it's going to be difficult. All right, 90 degrees and one half, one quarter of a half a turn. Just want to snug it down. up good get that out of the way if you're wondering I just keep this in the bed of the truck tucks nicely under our hitch I'm gonna wipe down under here get any oil off of this because when I leak check this later I want to be able to see any new oil that might come out of here if you remember our dipstick is only this long so you know that we're gonna have oil almost all the way up to the cap in here keep that in mind when you're filling it the type of oil you use is gonna depend on the type of conditions that you're in. Uh, most of your manuals are gonna have some recommended oil weights along with temperature ranges. Now we're going to the desert next week and it's gonna be really hot. We went with the thickest stuff, which was the 30 weight. The next level up is 15W40. This 30 weight is only good above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The 15W40 in our instance is good for, I think, uh, zero up to 100, but I want it to be able to go over 100 because I know next week it's going to be like 103, 105. It's been 103 here in Utah where we are now. Uh, so I'm using 30 weight and I would prefer a synthetic, but this was all I could find. You can also get the genuine Onan oil, which is fine also. I've used that in the past. I just didn't have that available right now. It was out of stock online. So I just went to O'Reilly and got some 30 weight. So the process here is to add the oil, run it for a bit, let it settle, check it, add, run, 
settle, check. You want to be able to get the oil all circulated and up in there and then let it settle because I know from experience this might overflow a bit. Here's where I'll want to start paying attention for overflow. Oh, there it is. So I can't really add a whole lot more yet. I'm gonna put the cap on, crank it up. Do not crank it up without putting that cap on. <laughs> it will spit oil out. Obviously before I can start it, I have to reconnect my negative battery lead. I know that I need to add more oil because this thing is only about that far down. I remember now it taking a bit to get that second quart fully in there. So let's give her a start here. Just ran it for about a minute, just so I can get the oil circulating through. And I'm right about where I was before, about a third of the way here. A little more oil in there. And you'll see as I fill it, it immediately goes back down. So I'm just gonna keep filling this until it doesn't go down anymore. Pour slowly so it can go down as you're pouring. It looks like the oil is full and there's no way you can get more oil in there, but you keep putting it in, it keeps going down. I've got almost the full two quarts in there now. There's a little bit left in here and it's not going down as far now. According to the dipstick, we're full. So I'm gonna run it for a little while again. and let it cool and settle for just a minute before I recheck the oil. While I wait for that, let's go ahead and change out the air filter. I've just got three clips here. One, two, three. And this should pop right off like this. And this should just pop right out here. I'm gonna go ahead and clean in here a little bit. It's got some sand. We're inside all the edges here. This hooks up underneath there. Don't pinch any hoses. That's it, the air filter, super easy. Oil level checked here again. Yeah, it's still full. I'm gonna see if I can put a little more of this in, see if I put it in, it goes down anymore. All right, I've got the full two quarts in there, which also is a good indication that I drained enough oil out, so I'm happy. I'm gonna run it for about another five minutes, check the oil again, and if it's good, we'll call it good. Let that cool down for a second, let the oil settle. All right, we are full. And as you can see, the oil is much cleaner now. That's the whole point. So now we're done with 150 hour maintenance. So let's talk a little bit about the 500 hour maintenance for our generator. For us, the thing that gets changed at 500 hours is spark plug and the fuel filter. Now I'm not gonna change this out today because we don't need to. Uh, we're not having any performance issues. That's also another reason you might wanna change your fuel filter is if uh, you're not quite getting the power out of it that you should. Uh, it could be a clogged up fuel filter. Super easy to get to. However, I already saw if I were gonna change this out today, I would have one snag. You'll notice that this end screws in. So the process is to take your fuel line off 
cap it or crimp it in some way so fuel's not leaking everywhere. You run the generator to suck the rest of the fuel through and just get it out of there. I think, the, I think our manual says to run it for like two minutes or something. Probably can run it until it shuts off, it means it's out of gas. But that just stops fuel from backing out of the system. You then unscrew your old one, screw your new one in, and attach your line, and then you fire it up and run it. The problem I see immediately is that our line over here is connected with a crimp, meaning that once I get it off there, I need a new crimp to recrimp it, or I need to put a worm screw clamp on there, uh, which I don't have with me, I don't think, but I will know that for when I do this. So just don't just go pulling off your fuel line and not knowing how you're gonna reconnect it. Now changing the spark plug is another story. Again, I've not done that yet. That could be another thing that you might replace if you've got low power. Uh, the fuel filter and the spark plug can both be causes of low power. We've not had any issues, so therefore I'm not changing them until we need to at the 500 hour maintenance period. But just looking at the spark plug here, it took me a minute to find it. It's actually, I'm not going to touch it because it's hot still, but it's tucked right back in there. I imagine it might be a little tricky to get a wrench back in there because obviously none of this stuff can come off. You have to get a wrench up in there. I was able to get needle nose and basically just pop the connector off, which is just, you know, the standard spark plug connector here. I was able to get the spark plug socket on there. There we go. So I think this would be doable, although I don't think I would be getting my actual socket in here. I don't know. It might fit, not really. So I probably would have to use an open end or wrench on the outside of that there. I'm not gonna screw with it right now just because it's not necessary. Additionally, there's another spark plug on this side, which you can see right there. That one's obviously much simpler to get to. If you have done this on this generator before and you've gotten that spark plug out, I'd love to hear down below in the comments uh, any issues you might have had or tricks you have to get that off of there. I'm gonna flip my breakers back on here so the next time I start this, it'll actually provide power. So a couple of tips and safety precautions. When you run this generator, particularly this gas generator and you know maybe others as well, the exhaust is carbon monoxide and it's poisonous. So you don't want to run your generator with your windows open in your RV. The exhaust can go out, get pulled in, and you know, you could die. Uh, you also want to be careful about running any kind of fans inside. When you push air out, air has to come in. Even if you don't have any windows or doors or anything like that open, air is still coming in from the outside. So never run your max air fans or whatever brand you have along with your generator because it could be sucking in carbon monoxide from the outside. I also mentioned you wanna keep this cover on even if it's super hot out. Your intake is this whole section right here that sucks air in and then the exhaust is over on this side. Additionally on the side over here, there is a muffler up underneath this grate and on that muffler is a spark arrester. Every 50 hours on hours, you have to pull that and run the generator to clean out the soot and then put it back in it. That part is pretty simple. I'm not gonna be doing that part today because I've just done that recently. When you're in a situation like we are here where the nose is low because the ground isn't level, of course, this generator and its exhaust and intake down here are a little bit blocked, so be aware of that but also your exhaust comes out down below here and goes off to the side. So make sure that the exhaust pipe and all that is clear of anything that it might set on fire. Grass, bushes, whatever. Another tip is if you're going to run your generator and you're connected to shore power like we are now, either shut off the breaker like I did for this maintenance or shut off your shore power. The reason being is that automatic transfer switch is supposed to just flip over and disconnect one and you know, connect the other. And if it has a problem and somehow leaves both of those relays down and connects the shore power system to the generator system and they're both supplying power, uh, that can cause problems and I've heard of that burning up automatic transfer switches. It's best practice, even though it technically might not be necessary, to shut off shore power if you're gonna run generator. Another quick tip is we get asked a lot about AGS or automatic generator start. 
And the idea there is that when your batteries get low, it'll automatically kick your generator on and fire it up and charge your batteries. It's a really good idea in theory. The problem is, usually when we're running off battery, we're inverting and we're pulling a decent load, especially if we kick on an AC or something like that. The trouble is, the settings for the automatic generator start are all voltage based, meaning that you can say, hey, at this voltage threshold, kick on the generator and charge the batteries. Again, great in theory. The trouble is when you actually have a heavy load on your DC system, like say you're running an inverter and you've got the AC going or some other heavy loads, it makes your measured voltage drop. And even if you have fully charged batteries, that voltage drop will be enough to kick on your generator. So we don't use ours. Ours is actually shut off because what will happen is if we're running the inverter, we kick on the AC, generator kicks on. No bueno. Another type of AGS that we're looking into is a SOC AGS or a state of charge AGS. So for a true state of charge, you need something like uh, the BMV 712 that we used to have or the smart shunt that we have now. We haven't shown you guys that yet because you haven't seen our solar video. We're still working on that. But the idea there is if you have a system that's truly monitoring your batteries, the current in, the current out, and has a true state of charge, that can be set to say, kick on the generator when I'm down to 20% battery or 50% battery or whatever you set it to. And that's much more reliable because a true state of charge is much more accurate than just strictly voltage. It's super easy thing to do, super important, so be sure you take care of your generator.